my first question that I'd like to ask you is what ambition means to you? For me, it's about making change. The big ambition I've got is to make change. So under that definition, are you ambitious? I think probably more aspirational or ambitious, but I'm yeah, pretty determined, I think, in terms of, you know, if I see that I think there's something that's not working, I'll, uh, I'll try and do something about it rather than just live with it. It sounds like that word ambition is a little bit uh, uncomfortable, maybe, or awkward with you. But you're more comfortable to describing yourself as something like driven or aspirational than calling yourself ambitious. Yeah. I'm ambitious to see within a certain framework. I guess I'm not really so ambitious for myself. Yeah, I guess I'm always looking to be better than what I am. Why do you think you're that way? Where did that come from, do you think? Probably struggling to satisfy myself. Part of what I've found as a life experience, particularly as a veterinarian, is that you're always trying to meet other people's expectations. And uh, you're sort of constantly feeling that you're not doing that. So you're constantly looking to try and improve. And when we were corresponding and setting this up, you were talking about how you'd really changed your focus from your original time as a vet. Do you want to talk a little bit about that process? It's probably something that we all go through at some point. Being a veterinarian was something I always wanted to be from the time I was four years older, so it just it was nothing else that ever featured. So you sort of come through, I guess, with a bit of a picture of what this looks like, and then you go to a university, and, and then you come out, and you start to realise how little you actually know that after having thought that you actually know a lot. There was no kind of aha moment or say, oh, finally, I've got there. It's like running up a hill. You get to a corner, you think, oh, I've got to the top. And then, of course, you go around, there's another corner and there's still some more hill to go up. And I guess it's like that to some extent. You also learn that what we were taught really doesn't bear a whole lot of reality. And we tend to take on board that this is the way things are in a very prescriptive kind of format. And then as you start to get exposed to things that are happening around you, I guess I've also got a nature of I, I always look behind things. I always try and understand why things are happening rather than accept them at face value. You know, I specialise in reproduction, I specialise in ruminant nutrition, thinking that you know, we've got better understandings of the way things are from that point of view we'd better be able to actually achieve improvements, particularly from an animal point of view. And then just started to see that the whole thing wasn't working. So the whole process that we were bringing, if you like, which is a relatively high prescriptive interventionist kind of process to veterinary medicine, and particularly in the large production animal scene, just wasn't making a difference. I developed a program which is around uh, holistic and preventative medicine kind of program and the expectation that we were going to sort of be able to work more with farmers, build capacity and understanding, and it, and it still didn't work. Effectively had a, an epiphany day where I was standing beside a whole bunch of cows watching me go past and just said, this isn't working, I've got to change. And then it was a little bit about understanding why that wasn't working, what the issues were, and went on a bit of a research journey for a few years just to try and get a better feel for what was and what the alternatives were, and then much more about a change management kind of program of we're going to bring about change. How can we do that? So um, quite a big shift. And then also from a focus on animals to recognising that actually if we're going to make a difference to animals, we've got to do it through people and also through the soil. That driver to make things better, to make a difference, is now directed in a somewhat different direction. So you talk about the importance of people and the soil. Where did that sort of epiphany lead you to? When I was running my dairy concepts program, and it was a program we were doing globally, the cow was at the centre of that universe, if you like, and everything that we do on a farm, whether it's people related, whether it's environmentally related or business, it all impacts on the health and welfare of that animal. And I guess the, the epiphany shift was that actually we can't change the welfare of that animal unless I'm actually dealing with the environment, because this constant process of trying to fix an animal that's been growing on land that's actually degenerating, is it's not going to work. So we've got two biological systems, if you like, a microbiome and the animal and a microbiome and the soil that have got to work in harmony. And if we're killing the soil, the animal's never going to work. We were just missing a critical piece. Then ultimately, the biggest impact on all of those is people. So we want to change the way we're going to deal with our environments and the way we're going to deal with our animals. We've got to do that through people. So the whole social change is really the key part of it, which is what I tried to avoid when I became a veterinarian, because I didn't think I'd have to work with people. So when you talk about where you're at now in terms of seeking that harmony, what is your focus currently? 
I guess the biggest issue that we've got as a barrier to change is mindset. People are wired for predictability. They're wired to sort of think they can do A and B and it's going to equal Z, whereas actually in living systems and life, it doesn't work that way. We deal with complexity rather than complicated problems, I guess. And when we try and provide complicated solutions to complex problems, we effectively get chaos. So all of these unintended consequences that we see in land and animals and the environment and social health are all connected, if you like, to that kind of approach. A big part of what ARTA is now all about, really, is to try and help people understand the difference, if you like, between living systems design or regenerative design and the current mechanistic paradigm that we tend to work in, and then the impacts that that can have and how that can actually start showing up in our own lives and our organisations, and but most importantly in agriculture. The tools that, that I try and use with an agricultural focus is around what are the opportunities? They're still trying to find what are the pathways that we can actually start to get people to be interested in something different. And to do that, you really have got to challenge their existing reality. I mean, we've got 30, 40 years of teaching people the current program, if you like, around agriculture, which is very mechanistic. So if we're going to try and move them from that, where can we start to reshape what good looks like? So they start asking questions about their current system, and then we can find a path, if you like, to actually help work through that capability and understanding. So if you're looking to move someone from a kind of mechanistic mindset to some sort of more ambitious systems approach, what's the strategy there? Where do you start with moving people from point A to point B? I mean, it's very contextual. It really depends on who it is you're working with. It's really about trying to find the point of least resistance. If you can start to get them to question a little bit of what they think is so black and white in their reality. And the thing about farmers is that they are generally still observational. So if you can just start to point out a few little things and say, well, look, if that's the case, why is this starting to happen? How do you explain that? And uh, we've got this real tension, if you like, in science, where we've now got this very reductionist silo science, which actually supports the fact that if we put, you know, we need to put nitrogen on to make our land grow. Whereas we're trying to get farmers to recognise the biggest component in our atmosphere is nitrogen. If you've got a healthy plant, you don't need to be putting artificial nitrogen on. And in fact, if you're putting nitrogen on, you're actually killing the system. But if we confront that directly, farmers are just going to say, actually, you know, we've got a whole bunch of scientists that are telling us this is all we need to do. And I guess my approach to that is to say, well, let's, let's just look out the window because science still can't explain fire. So just because scientists can't explain what we're doing doesn't mean to say that it's not real. So, you know, we've got degrading waterways and we're losing topsoil. or We've got other things that we all know are happening. So why is that happening if what we're doing is correct? I just remember my dad was one of the first people to start getting his soil tested. I think it was in the 1980s and it was considered to be quite a fringe activity at the time. There was almost a peer pressure issue there. He was trying to do something that was at the fringes of what other people were comfortable with. Do you have any sort of strategies or approaches to kind of moving the collective mindset as well as the individual mindset or is it always a one person at a time thing? No, it's got to be collective. In fact, our real target is policy change. So what we talk a lot about is creating conditions. So effectively, what we're trying to do is create conditions for better social outcomes or better agricultural or environmental outcomes. And current policy keeps taking us back, if you like, to where we're going. So we try to work a lot with groups, organisations, agribusiness industries, if you like, where we can start getting a more collective shift towards a different paradigm. With that, you've still got to have support structures in place. You know, I think it was Wendell Berry who sort of said, well, you can't fix something by pulling apart what exists, you've got to create a parallel that works beside it. And that's kind of what we're doing is how do we start to put something together that farmers in particular can see can work and would be a better place for them to be. And that'll be small to start with. The biggest advocate for change really is somebody looking at it. It's like that peer pressure, as you said, the farmer looks over the fence and says, well, my neighbor's actually doing something that looks like it's really he's got a new car or it's, you know this kind of thing and how do i get into that space what do i need to do when you can reverse that role rather than us telling them them they're asking that you get a lot more traction so i mean we set after up as an open framework around regenerative design and we're open to anybody sort of coming in and saying well where do we fit in this how does this work for us how can we start to be different in this space one of the real issues in the community that I come from is around 
mental health and well-being for the farming community. And what you're describing is something that feels much more congruent and that you're working with the system rather than against the system. And I wonder if you have any observations around whether people who are working in this different way, whether it improves their well-being as well as the well-being of the system they're working in on the farm. You've jumped to it very quickly, obviously, because of you know, your awareness around these kind of things. The community is breaking down. We don't have community anymore. And this is all about connection. It's about individual connection. It's about connection with land. And, and all of the, the wicked problems that we're seeing in the world today really are around the breakdown of those connections. We like to think in New Zealand we're, we're really good at what we do and from a farming point of view. But you know, we've got 27-odd thousand farms. The average size is about 350, 360 hectares. Well, that farm struggles to support one family and then generally only because one of the partners is working on farm. So, you know, we, from an economic point of view, we've got tremendous pressures on landowners or land managers to try and perform under a system which really doesn't support community. That's just getting worse. When it becomes about production at all costs, whether that is within an organisation or within a farming system, you can't do that without actually starting to treat the parts of that like a machine and they become dispensable and you break down those connections. And then when connections break, things die. So I guess a big part of what we are trying to do is to recreate or regenerate those connections, if you like, and particularly a connection with the land. Our food doesn't has only got 40% of the nutrient value it had even 20 years ago because of the way we farm it. And, and then, you know, we've got all that toxic products that now in, in our food as a consequence of farming. So a lot of what's happening in our mental situations and our health situations is a consequence of what our nutrients and those toxins are doing to our things like our blood-brain barrier and our immune status and all of these kind of things. So if we can start getting people connected back to food production and the ability to actually self-sustain, better feel-good activities, connecting this community. I mean, I've got a farm I've been working with you know, down in the South Island, you know, a group of farms, and, and you know, talking to the CEO, he's, he's on the one hand, they've had the Ashburton River come through one of their farms and just wipe the whole thing out. Now, on the other hand, he said, look, it's amazing, you know, with the, the level of engagement in the community that's coming out as a consequence of these challenges is, is great. He said, in a way, you kind of enjoy it. Um, the other thing I'm wondering about, when you talk about this production at all costs sort of mindset, the inevitable consequence of that is sort of just continued consolidation, I think. If we're going in this different direction, perhaps smaller farms might be more, more economic if you're treating the soil better, that ultimately you don't need to just have these behemoth, monstrous sized things, and that perhaps, you know, a, a smaller unit of people could make a living on, you know, because generations ago they did. Yeah, so, so I mean, a really big part of that, Jim, is diversity. Yeah, again, as we corporatise and consolidate, as you say, we've tended to doing that around monocultures, whether they be a plant species. We've started to look at how, generally, how we can control nature rather than work with nature or learn mm. from nature more specifically. When you start to diversify across the land base and what that land base can do, I mean, look at Canterbury, a great example. Take all the trees out and put on irrigation and just put ryegrass and dairy cows on it. And, and are we getting massive issues as a consequence of that? Whereas that land base can support a whole lot of different growths. Trees will actually enhance the environmental impact of that farming, but it'll also allow different, you know, you can be growing nuts, you can be growing a whole variety of different products, which create enterprise opportunities and bring diversity back. 350 hectares and we struggle to support one family. And yet yeah. we've in farms in Africa that have got 10 hectares and support five families. And the encouraging thing is, is that the majority of food produced in the world still comes from small family farms. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this whole concept that you've got to be a massive big behemoth to actually feed the world is just nonsense. We need to teach each other. We need to teach people to feed themselves first and then think about how they provide for community and then perhaps nations and the global trade. When the only measure, if you like, that we take is about production or economics, we generally do that at the cost of the system rather than how do we now start to measure health in the system rather than just economic health? How do we value community health? How do we value human health? They have to become much bigger parts of the discussion. Do you think that generational change is going to provide an opportunity for leverage here? Because thinking in terms of the average age of people who currently own farms, the children of those people can't afford to buy in. 
I see it as a real problem. I'm not sure. I don't know a solution, but it's succession is going to become very difficult with the way land is being valued. And we do quite a lot of work with states and we're involved in a program in the US called Land to Market. And, and consumers are telling us that they're concerned now. I guess the generational change opportunity I see is around consumers and consumers telling us that they are concerned about environment, they're concerned about animal welfare, they're concerned about those changes and knowing where their food comes from. There's no reason why New Zealand can't have a complete change in its focus from this commodified production at all costs kind of approach to a smaller consumer-focused kind of... I mean, we produce something like 0.18% of the world meat and 4% of the world milk. We're small enough you know, to go to a consumer-facing value-added product and start to show up completely differently, both at the farm level and also at the consumer level. Yeah, that's kind of the paradigm that we're trying to drive as the lever of change. I think even beyond the environmental and the animal welfare, something that's coming up a lot in the migration space that I also work in is concern about the people. So consumers are wanting to know that whatever they're consuming is ethically produced in the broadest possible way. And so as well as the environmental and animal welfare impacts, they want to know that the people who are producing it, you know, have had a reasonable life. They don't want people being exploited. Mm -hmm. They don't want people being exhausted. And if you look at the standard production model, for want of a better description, that's really inconsistent with the desires of the people who are looking to buy your products. And increasingly, we're seeing that starting to come to the fore in terms of what people are demanding. There is currently, I think, a mismatch between how we present ourselves in markets and how we actually are at home across all of those dimensions. And ultimately, if we don't fix that, you know, we're going to be caught out. You know, it would be nice to think that we'd get ahead of this and do the right thing because it's the right thing. But I also think that some people might be motivated by fear as well as hope, right? Yeah, well, I think fear is a really big one. And, and I guess a big issue within our agricultural industry is, is the control of the banks and the levels of debt. And I guess one of the first things that I came to when I started to look at this change was really around the people issues. A part of what we tried to do was build capability and understanding around how the model we had on dairy farms particularly. And yet, we weren't getting anywhere. So one of the barriers was employment. So in 2011, I did a large survey around 10% of the large dairy herds in New Zealand where we went and you know, one-on-one interviews with the operational manager of that farm plus two staff members. It was 375 hours of interview. And I think it's still the biggest study of its type that's been done in New Zealand. 57% of the staff members that we interviewed had been on that farm less than a year. And 17% of them were going to leave within three months of interview. And when you've got that level of turnover of staff within the industry, I mean, what hope have you got? And, and it's no better today. It's just not sustainable. And people put their head in the sand, and that's part of the problem, is, is that we constantly get reinforced that we're good. And people put their heads in the sand and say, well, we are good, so we, we don't need to move from where we are. So we just keep doing what we're doing. You know, again, it's that mindset that becomes, how do we break that mindset? How do we move people out of that space? If you had a magic wand and could wave it and have one thing changed to enable you to sort of achieve these ambitions in this space, what would be the one thing you'd like to see change? Excuse me, but probably political bullshit. <laughs> because, I, I mean, I just get so sick of the politics of this based around agency and ego. That's yeah. what's stopping us from changing. Is, is it, I mean, we did a research study with the University of Otago going back a few years. The red meat industry they've classified as, a, as an industry in extinction. They give it 10 years. Mm. And yeah, with our commodified model around mostly ingredients, most of what we produce and sell globally is ingredients focused. And so the consumer's got no idea of what it is or where it comes from. It's all bought on price. So we're very, very vulnerable to synthetics and substitutes. We need to think as a country what we want that design to look like. And yet we can't get these people to talk together. Again, they're just stuck in their own agency. They just won't talk outside of the silos. We can't get cross-sector communication going. And so that becomes really frustrating. There's still a, a remnant of this kind of gentlemanly approach in New Zealand in terms of how business behaves. 
And if you think about moving away from that straight commodity to sort of more processed stuff, as soon as you come up with something decent and start exporting it, the pattern in the US in particular is that someone will white label what you've done. You know, it happened with all birds, it happens with all of our best innovations. And we kind of have this mindset in New Zealand, I think, that you can sell this high quality raw input and that will be enough for people to kind of just continuously take it. And also that if we then start to process things a little bit, that will be enough. There's not the sense that we need to keep moving. What is adequate is quite minimal. You know, looking at how things are evolving overseas, I worry. I worry about reputational impact. Yeah, and I worry about consumer awareness, for want of a better description, kind of rising up and becoming an issue for us. And how do we get ahead of that? You know, a really good example is this winter management thing on with cattle. I don't know whether you've been aware of that from New York, but I mean, particularly in the South Island, where people put cows for the winter on small areas on crop from an animal welfare and an ecological point of view, there was no justification. There was no, there was no reason to be able to defend that. And yet, as an industry, we defend that and look at ways that we can make that work. So when that starts showing up in our international press, still trying to push this clean green image, the connection is actually just getting wider and wider. And it's the same as what you said about employment standards. And I mean, we have the highest youth suicide rate in the world. We have the highest pay addiction rate in the world. Our social standards are actually really poor. So when we try and put this image out that actually is just completely different from what's actually showing up, you know, we just lose credibility. Those are the things that we've got to start to change. How do we start to show up differently in those marketplaces? Because the unfortunate reality is, is if we're all going to survive economically, we're still going to be reliant on some kind of export-based industry. Five million people can't sustain five million people with where we've got to within our lives. But we need to turn the paradigm around, though, and we need to be inward focusing in terms of ourselves before we think about the rest of the world. Because the rest of the world actually is more interested in us looking after ourselves and mm -hmm. then using that product than thinking about the ingredients that we provide. It's interesting, as you were talking about the suicide and addiction rate, I think there's a question about what's the chicken and what's the egg there. And I think that disconnect between the image that we are told we are and what people feel in themselves is actually part of that story. So if you're told that we are the best and we're clean and green and yet you instinctively feel we are simply not, that is not a path to well-being that sense of absolute disconnect. It's an underlying cause of some of those serious issues of lack of well-being. We're starting to try and do more work in the organisational health space, particularly around you know, the principles of living systems, you know, mutualism, equity. Most organisations just don't even want to know. They just want to continue to do what they do. They don't recognise all those problems that we talk about. Are, those are the guys next door. Mm -hmm. We're fine the way we are, thanks, and we're just going to carry on doing what we're doing. And yet they've got high turnover rates. They've got all, all of the symptoms that you'd be aware of are showing up in those organisations. To me, they become the real targets. Because until we can start to get those principles within much more part of our lives and the way we engage with other people, we're going to really struggle to make those social changes. Such a scary thought, isn't it? Like given where our education system is headed, given where our economy is headed, none of it is emerging towards diversification. It's all pulling in on specialisation. It's the opposite of what we need. Yeah, well, we've got choices, I guess, and a big part of our challenge is to help people identify there are other choices and there are other models. I mean, there are some really good people working in that space, you know, like Mark. You get some really good minds and, and uh, we've just got to continue to try and create conditions for those people to start to emerge and evolve and start showing up in decision-making positions. It sounds like you've made an enormous amount of progress in a space that's quite challenging. What do you see as other barriers that will need to be dismantled in order to continue? I just keep coming back to those principles of living systems and the shifts, if you like, that you need to make to bring those you know, and it's this whole movement from sort of competition to collaboration. I mean, we are dreadful at that at New Zealand. I mean, we like to have these small entities that are isolated and we're not good at actually integrating and collaborating and talking across sectors. The beauty of getting out on the land from time to time and looking at it is, is the reinforcement. And then you meet you know, some good people and you get that reinforcement that actually, well, I've got grandkids now. I don't, I want them to have a future. Those things drive me now. 
you know, we've got choices. We'll either make the right ones or the wrong ones. And it's not black or white, but the Earth's going to survive. The Earth will survive. The world will survive regardless of what we do. It's really our choice is how long we want to be part of that. And those are the decisions that we're making today.